Hola mi gente, you are listening to Dancing into Parenthood, the Entre la Familia series, where Latinos get to hear our stories about raising our children with special needs. I am your host, Dr. Divina Lopez, board certified pediatrician for over 10 years and mom to a little boy with autism and ADHD. My motherhood journey has been my greatest inspiration to creating this podcast because when it comes to our community, we have unique circumstances that we keep entre la familia that we need to share and no longer keep quiet about. On this show, I will give you the tools, information, and strategies to raising a happy and healthy human being. Each week, I am connecting you with other Latino families who have generously shared their personal journeys and struggles so that you can have clarity and insight on what it takes to raise such a special child. Before the episode starts, I want to remind you to follow us on social so you don't miss out on all the support I love to share with you. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok at Dr. Divina Lopez and any place that you hang out on the internet. Also, I can't wait to start the parent sessions. We're starting group parent sessions and I want you to be there. I want to help guide you if you are struggling with parenthood, if you don't have support, if you're insecure about the choices that you're making for your child, if you just want to get it right for your child, then I encourage you to join the 12 week program where we will meet once a week and I will teach you how to advocate for your child, how to navigate the medical system, how to navigate the educational system, where to find your support system, and how to build healthy family relationships so we can break those toxic cycles, create boundaries with family members, and also learn to love ourselves through it all. All right, mi gente, I want to see you there. So make sure that you go to my website and that you drop your email in there. That way you are the first to know when the group sessions start. Now let's get into the episode. Hello, mi gente, and welcome back to Dancing into Parenthood. You know already that these have been my favorite episodes so far because Entre la Familia, we know, you know, what goes on in our culture and our households and how it's unique. Um, And so for me, bringing out these episodes was, I mean, it really is a a big piece of my heart. It's something that I've been wanting to do for a really long time because serving my community is super important and sharing our stories are very, very important. Uh, Today I have Marlene Soto and she is a mom to a little boy um, who has a few different things going on. So she always talks um, from her business, which is called the Swan Kid. And she has her books, which I love because it's all about inclusion. And that is, of course, very important to me, especially because, you know, my son goes through all of these similar situations. Um, I first saw Marlene on TikTok and I loved what she was talking about. I loved her son immediately because her son and my son look alike. So when I when I see AJ, I see Aaron, you know. And they're they're very like close in age. And when I see the the sort of post that she puts of like, she's just very honest about like who he is and you know the behaviors and it's very, very similar. It's very similar. So, you know, for me seeing AJ is is like looking at Aaron, right? And I see their struggles and I see their accomplishments and I see all the love. And she's just a typical Puerto Rican mama with all of that like she's fighting and advocating all the time for her son and she's sharing how she does it and I know she's just like fierce in that area like I really admire her um for doing all the work that she does um and I I just 
I relate so much to her on so many levels. You know, I think you're really, really smart, Marlene. I know that you're always, you know, talking about very personal things and you share all of this information um, about yourself, what it's really like. You do the very honest sort of post where, you know, you're like, you know, some days are great and some days suck. And this is the, the journey that I've gone through. Um, and I love that you do that because you, you highlight the highs and the lows. And that's what this journey is about, right? Like, um, this journey of being gifted a child with special needs is really about how do you get through those highs and lows, right? Um, it really shows you how strong you are as a person. Oh, it'll make you really strong. And, you know, how much courage and bravery we really have, right? Um, our, our sons are, our, you know, our treasures. And so we do what we have to do for them. And, you know, that's just the bottom line. So thank you, Marlene, for coming on to the podcast. I know you're going to have so many drums for everybody listening. Um, I, I think you're a beautiful person inside and out. And, you know, I just want to start off by asking you, because you, you've really gone through it since like day one. I think for me personally, it took me a while, right, before I was in just looking at like, what were some of my concerns with my son and stuff like that, right? So I would like for you to share like, just from the beginning, like, what were some of the, the things that actually were concerning for you? What was your journey like from the beginning? Because you told me you had a, a normal pregnancy. Um, so if you can just like, start off with what was it like in those very first few days where you're coming from a normal pregnancy. You're not expecting complications, right? You're 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 expecting a healthy baby, um, and then things change. Well, thank you so much for having me and all your beautiful words. You already choked me up in the first like three minutes. Okay. Um, but I get on every day to spread awareness, but to just be relatable. Mm -hmm. So, about the highs and lows are huge for me. And um, going back into when I first found that I was pregnant, everything was smooth sailing mm -hmm. until the moment I delivered. Mm -hmm. And when I delivered, he was measuring up until then, um, a little small for gestational age. And then when I gave birth, um, he was having difficulty in breathing. So with that being said, they found a couple other anomalies, like an extra thumb and his head size was smaller than average. So they whisked him away to ICU for almost three weeks. In there, you're getting looked at by all the specialists. So I'm already overwhelmed with having delivered a baby, having all these complications, not anticipating one of them. Um, so I just was focused on making sure that my child is going to walk out of there okay, you know, healthy or good enough to come home with me. In the upcoming months and weeks, um, because of the fact that they told me while in ICU, he, they believe he had a genetic disorder. You know, when you first have a newborn baby, no one is thinking autism. These are things that back then you weren't even trained to think of it till at least three years old, right? So in my first few weeks to be told a genetic disorder, I went home and I said, okay, well, I'm not going to see the specialist for two whole months. So I'm watching everything he's doing, like every little coo, cry, whatever it was, I was like jotting it down. So that gave me an advantage when it came to seeing things early on in the signs where I can go back and say, you know what? Those were absolute signs from the beginning. And now I know what they were. But because of the fact that there was a genetic component it was being dismissed like yeah you're thinking autism for example the first year of my son's life he in the first six months was not smiling when I say did not smile did not smile you know when they say that children on the spectrum don't show emotions and things like that this is why I believe like it is born it is in his gene like he did not crack a smile that's not average you have babies that are two days old and will laugh you know he did not follow 
Yeah. He did not follow you. He did not see you for months, you know. Um, he didn't care if there were kids running around. Um, he didn't care to, um, he walked at one years old, but he didn't sit up until about nine months. And that could be more of a genetic factor, absolutely. But with people in his presence, it was like he was not aware. He was like unbothered by things. Right? Unbothered. But he could focus on something. He could focus on something. So it's not like he didn't know something existed. It was just unbothered completely. I think a major thing for me was also that he didn't recognize me as mom. I can come and go and he would never cry for me. He would never cry for milk. He never cried for food. Let me just go back on one thing just to clarify. During your pregnancy, the ultrasounds, the ultrasounds that were done, did they show that he was a little bit on the smaller side? Just his head size was a little bit on the smaller side. And that was towards my like last trimester, last few weeks. Other than that, I would this, this okay. is important. This is important because I think that a lot of doctors and, and you know, the moms, because the moms don't know, right? But a lot of doctors are not realizing that these are big signs, actually, right? So studies now are showing that there are many abnormalities that are being found on the prenatal ultrasounds. My son also was on the smaller side. They didn't comment really on his head being smaller, but he had an anomaly in his chest the whole entire time that we had to see a high risk doctor for. And they could never give us an explanation. And we did have to go to um, get a fetal um, echo done and everything was, yeah, everything was fine. Right. So these are things that OBGYNs need to start paying attention to, right. And start understanding that these little tiny signs that they're actually capturing on ultrasound are significant because what happens with me, I believe it was in my second trimester, we ended up having to do the whole fetal echo. We go to the pediatric cardiologist. He does everything. He's like, everything looks fine. No worries. We will follow up later after the baby is born and we'll do another echo, which that's protocol, right? I'm used to that. I was like, okay, no worries, right? My high risk doctor though, um, wanted to do like a fetal MRI. He, I was going in like weekly for ultrasounds. My son seemed to be growing fine. We did extra blood work. Everything was fine. Um, it was always just this concern about like that chest area, what's there that they couldn't really explain. And then later on, they were like, oh, everything is clear. Like, you know, no worries. Um, but now looking back and knowing these studies that are coming out, I keep asking moms, like, did you have any sort of like abnormalities on the, on the ultrasounds? Because a lot of times they just tell you like these one, little, little things. And then they're like, oh, but everything is fine. Right. Um, so I, I, I'm noticing this more and more when I ask moms, like, let's look back even back then, because perhaps the whole pregnancy was fine. My pregnancy was fine. I was never sick. We were always good. Everything seemed fine. It was just this one little thing, but then we were told everything was fine. Um, and when my son was born and we followed up with the cardiologist, again, echo was fine. Everything was fine with his heart structure. Um, but it seems that children with autism do have these slight sort of abnormalities in the ultrasounds that are done prenatally and we need to start recognizing that that may be an early sign right like that may be the earliest signs and OBGYNs and moms need to be more aware of this so that we can not brush it off but see it as an early sign that we really need to follow up with this later on. You see, they brushed it off so much that yeah. I totally forgot until you mentioned it. Same yeah. thing happened. 
saw yeah. something in the press, had to see a pediatrician cardiologist, had to do an echo of the heart. And then they said, oh, everything is absolutely normal. You can go home. No problems. And yeah. that was it. Yeah, I know. We forget about these things because we were told everything is fine. It's okay. No problems. Nothing to worry about. And, um, and, and you'll see now in the future when more and more of these studies come out that that is going to be the first sign that even pediatricians now need to be aware of these things. And I don't, I don't think that, that they are. I don't think that general pediatricians are understanding the significance of asking these questions when you come in now after delivery. Like, you know, we always ask like, oh, um, did you have prenatal care? Was everything fine or whatever? But I think that even having been told that everything is okay at the end, let's not like discount that there was some sort of abnormality that was seen, but we- The collection of data seen, is, is, yeah, is, is so important. important. Because yes. The more you get, the more you realize, and then you'll say, you know what? This is another sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just putting that out there because I really don't think that that message is, is there. I don't think that the awareness is there, not even with the physicians themselves. And they, they really need to start putting some more attention and emphasis on how important this information is. It's a Absolutely. small piece of information, but it's a really important piece of information. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to like, <laughs> I didn't mean to, you know, stop your whole journey because, you know, your, your journey, just like you said, is unique, right? That you did have a little bit of information right from the start that made you a more like, oh, uh, or, or just made you more sensitive to tracking these things, right? Whereas most parents will just either compare their, their children to other kids, maybe that they know, right? Um, or they just wait for the pediatric visits and answer the questionnaires. You were more like hypervigilant about it. Like let's capture whatever we can and then we'll deal with it as we go along. Yeah, I was the, the mom from from before the child could fail to meet a milestone that I was already like, all right, I'm, I'm waiting for the milestone and I'm anticipating it may not happen because right. of the genetic factor. So because of that, I was the mom from the second month appointment with the list of like, these are the things I'm noticing, you know, where to most moms, you know, and I have another child and I can attest to the fact that I didn't do any of those things. You know, my right. child was born without any complications. So I didn't anticipate complications until after they occurred. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. So go on. I, I know you said at one years old, he started walking. He started walking and just what was real triggering for me is um, not speaking um, was obviously a major clue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he was babbling at six months for like a week and then stopped babbling completely. So there was no mama. This is, that a, this is no. a regression. I always tell parents like pay attention to these things, right? This is a frequent story that you will hear on repeat from parents with children on the spectrum. My kid was doing something and then they stopped out of nowhere. So even, even though he was just doing it for one week, he was doing it. He was doing it. He was mom, 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 mom. And I'm like, I know he's saying mama. And then he just stopped. And then I played it like, okay, you know, it's early. Like, that's fine. But when he hit nine months, 10 months, 11 months, 12 months, and he did not, he was able to run around my house, not acknowledge his own name, not acknowledge anyone in the room. Um, I could go on vacation, cry my eyes out for four days because I missed him, come home. And he looked at me like, he just saw me five minutes ago when we hadn't seen each other in four days. Like there was no signs of emotion, attachment. There was no cry. He just, he did not cry. He was not a crier. Like he waited in his bed until we walked into his room. And at this point, let's say a toddler bed where he could just hop off. He did not hop off. He waited for the good morning, AJ. And then he would know like reach out, hug, and then it's time. It's okay to get off the bed. If he was starving, he would never let you know. He wouldn't cry for a diaper change. He wouldn't, he just didn't indicate anything. He just stood quiet. Mind, like, first year, was he receiving any sort of like services or support? So I, 
attempted to get support as early as three months on mm -hmm. because of the genetic component. I was not going to wait for my son to not be able to walk, talk, or do anything. Right. Um, I had literally to dispute insurance company about three appeals before I got an approval. Mm -hmm. He was about nine months when he first started speech, physical, and occupational therapy. So mm -hmm. I started at around nine months, which I think is huge to any parent out there. The earlier you get the intervention, the better the outcome. I don't care what they say. Yeah, absolutely. And this is another thing. Like you are like number one when it comes to advocacy. Number one. I love that about you. Like you will figure it out. I love that you're like, nope, we're, I'm not taking that for an answer. And I'm going to go and we're going to appeal it. And we're still going to fight for this. And we're going to make sure that we get it. Like, if there is one thing that I can say about you, like, I would definitely like direct everybody to you just for advocacy alone, because you have absolutely figured out that you're not going to stay shut, that you're going to do whatever you have to do for your son. And you have figured out because it, it's so much right with the insurance companies with the physicians with everybody because you need a whole team when it comes to this you have figured out what you need to do in order to advocate for your son um so you know aj is very lucky that he has a mom like you or you know a parent who's so dedicated to this because it's not easy it's exhausting you feel defeated a lot right it's so challenging that you're like come on, you know, something's got to give because you got to literally like work on this every day. It feels like a, like another job. It feels like another job and, you know, motherhood and having to hold down a job and doing all the things that we need to do, like on a routine basis, eats up your time, you know, having to do this on top of it. I can't even imagine, um, you know, how much time and effort you've actually like put into this, right? Because you're right. Getting services early on is the most important thing. And I don't want people, especially moms, you know, we have our intuition. I don't want them to forget that, yeah, that person may be a professional, or you may be fighting a whole medical insurance system. But at the end of the day, you're the one who knows the most about your child, not them. I don't care if that person went to school for so many, you know, X amount of years and they could hold whatever certificate, award, whatever. It doesn't matter. You are the one who is the expert at your child, right? You spend the most time with them. You are the one that are, like you're there day in, day out. So it doesn't matter if in your heart of hearts, you know that this is not right. I know I need to get help for my kid. Keep fighting for it. Keep fighting for it. And look for the resources, right? You know, that's why we do this work because we're trying to share that with you because it was hard for us. And we don't want you to have to deal with that same sort of challenge. We're trying to, you know, help you navigate. That's the whole purpose of putting out this information. One of my biggest key points in, um, in my nonprofit organization, Helping Swans, I offer three different types of workshops. And one of my workshops is geared towards caregivers and parents um, and advocating. And I lead with, I am not an expert. I am AJ's expert. I'm my son's expert. You are that. You don't need certifications. You don't need the education. You don't even need the language, okay? Because where there's a will, there's a way. Like getting an interpreting certificate for me was vital to help my community, underrepresented Latinos in, in the disabled community, you know, where they are not getting the full potential of their appointments because the lack of someone talking. Um, I apologize for that. Um, but in the end, I pull through, I talk to the parents, I tell them doctors and even therapists, they have X amount of time with your child. You live with your child. If you watch your child on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not going to monitor them 24 hours. No, they're sleeping. They're in the bathroom. They're doing things. You're doing things, but you have the most time with them. It is your responsibility to go into these appointments, put it all out there. Any questions or concerns, there's no such thing as silliness. 
don't get um, deterred by friends and family shutting you down. Because a lot of the times we go to the people we trust and love and we think we can understand it. Sometimes they look at us like, girl, you're doing too much or stay off social media or stop listening to other parents. No, you know what? You have a concern. I don't care if it's as simple as my child's tiptoeing. You know what? You're right. Not every child that tiptoes is autistic, but guess what? There are a lot of them that are. So if you have a concern, maybe do find someone, go to a forum, go to social media, gravitate towards another mom that's been there. This is why I go on. And this is why I share my story because when I was looking for resources 10 years ago, I couldn't find any. When I was going through the things that I was going through, through every journey and every milestone, I didn't find that information. I want someone to be able to just type in the word and boom, I can see her story, her story. That sounds like my story. And when you don't find the answers and you don't feel that connection with the doctor, you feel like they're um, negating what you're saying or, or, or putting you down, like find another doctor, take your insurance somewhere else. Because you do have a right to look for a practitioner who is aligned with you, right? If you feel like this person is just in a rush, they're not um able to answer your questions properly they're not showing the compassion um you know go look for a second opinion there's no reason why you're stuck to anybody and it doesn't matter what kind of medical insurance you have or even if you don't um you know you have choices you're not stuck with one person there are so many physicians i you know i hear people complain all the time about doctors of like oh you know i i went to this visit and they didn't really care and So don't stay with them, right? Because it's the same way as if you have a partner who's not hearing you out, you know, you can easily leave there too. It's the same exact thing. You have a relationship with this person and this person, it does need to be a person who not only like hears you out, but also advocates for you and can help guide you um, because that's, that's their purpose in their field, right? It's not just about writing a prescription or a referral. It's not just about that, right? You should be able to like go to this person and also ask them about specialists. Like, what is your opinion on this person? Did you, you know, um, have any sort of uh, good, whatever, opinions about maybe what your patients, their, you know, experiences with those practitioners, like, because you will be seeing other specialists, right? You don't just want to be like willy nilly about it. You really have to have a, a good plan because these are these are the people who are in your support circle, right? So your when team. you're, it's your right, team. It's your team. It's your team. Your team. That team. That's long term because if your child gets diagnosed, if your child does have a um, condition, uh, whether it be autism or anything else, this is a team that you want. For the long haul, mm-hmm. you have to come correct. If you're if you're not getting that compassion, if you're not getting that back and forth understanding, you literally want to go ahead and find someone that aligns with what you're thinking and how you're thinking. Because yes, if you don't get a, a diagnosis, your child, let's say, is not on the spectrum, then great. But you had a doctor that listened to you, that directed you in the right path. And then together you came to the solution that, you know what? He's not. Or we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and take care of just speech. It may be a speech therapy thing that he needs. It may be a hearing thing that he needs help with. Whatever it is, but they listen to you and didn't dismiss you. So you want to start with that from the very beginning. I love that you said like don't worry about what like what your friends, your family, whoever might be like judging you on this. Um, because I feel like there is a lot of criticism, right? Um, I definitely received a lot of criticism and a lot of judgment. Um, especially because I'm a physician and then it was like, oh, you're overdiagnosing, you're overdoing it. Like, um, and I, I received that from everybody, like my own mother, his dad, like it was hard. It was really hard in the beginning because it made me second guess myself, right? Like, was I overdoing it? Um, although I never felt like I was overdoing it. I just wanted to make sure that I was providing the right support for my son, um, So I'm happy that you brought that up because I think that that is also a common thread in our community where we get this sort of like criticism. Moms get it a lot, right? It's it's the moms who hear it all the time. You're babying the kid, you're overprotective, you're a helicopter mom, you're this, you're that. 
um you know let the let the kid just be a kid you're you know um we're spoiling them uh so i've i've heard all of those criticisms about myself as a mother right um and i'm happy that you brought that up because i feel like it happens a lot where you know people just love to give unsolicited advice opinions right especially our family and friends because they feel so comfortable doing this with us and then we start to look at ourselves and we second guess ourselves, right? Or we tone it down a little bit because we think, okay, maybe I'm overdoing it. Maybe they're right. Um, but it's really important for you to go by your intuition. It's really important because you will never feel bad for doing the extra. <laughs> be extra here. You want to be extra anywhere? Be extra here. <laughs> yes. I don't know about you and your experience, um, professionally, but me, I have yet to come across a mom that had an intuition that failed when it comes to getting a diagnosis, maybe other things, but like a diagnosis, like you've seen the signs, you felt the sign. It may have taken years. My son took seven and a half years to get a diagnosis. Okay. But I knew from the very first time that I set up the first appointment at a year and a half years old, that my son was on the spectrum. And, you know, the comparison thing to other children is a double whammy in the sense that you compare milestones to other children because that's what the charts and statistics tell you to do, right? So should be talking, should be walking, should be following, should be pointing. But then you don't want to compare your child to anybody because children on the spectrum aren't like no other child, not even those on the spectrum, you know, like Aaron and AJ may have five things in common and may differ in 15,000 other ways. You know what I mean? But they're both on the spectrum. So um, that's the beauty of autism. So when other people like our family and friends, I, I can only speak for being Dominican and Puerto Rican and my background and the way they are is like, oh no, mija, that happens all the time. And I know somebody's son that didn't walk and talk for four years. Or I know this one that didn't do, sounds good. But I have to take care of mine because mine is mine. And this is my child. And at the end of the day, my child could talk and fully be on the spectrum. You know, everyone is absolutely different. So you just have to follow your intuition. And from, like I said, from my experience in all these years and talking and meeting, networking with other parents, I haven't met a parent that said, my whole time I thought my child was on the spectrum and I got to know everyone that has thought so has been. Um tell you this professionally I think that there have been many times when moms are concerned about certain things uh that maybe I don't even see at that time but I will always address it and this is what I think is important when you have a doctor not someone who's dismissive and tells you like oh no I don't even see any of that there's nothing to be worried about that may feel good at the moment because you're like oh okay they're not even worried about that right that may feel good in the moment, but what happens is that you go home and you keep seeing what you're concerned about. And then you're like, but I still see it and it's still bothering me and it's not going away, right? So I think that for me personally, as a provider, anything that parents bring up as concerns, even if it's something like minuscule, I address it because I never want to say that I know more than you about your kid because I don't right um and I want you to have peace of mind uh -huh. right because I, I do have some parents that they are very anxious about things and so they'll be like oh my goodness I you know I saw this thing like one time or something like that I'm, okay you know I rather put people at ease and exactly. I rather really explain to you why or why not you know, that's something to be concerned and how we're going to address it. Because when you have a parent who comes in with a concern and you dismiss it or say like, oh, let's just wait. Oh, nothing to worry about. I think that's a poor way to handle it um, because that parent is going to go back home with that child and they're still going to have that concern. And without doing more of like discovery for what may be there or may not be there that's doing a disservice to any family right so 
if you have a doctor who's dismissive, um, who, you know, just everything is watch and wait, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you should get another opinion because watch and wait can be okay for a certain amount of time because every kid can reach a milestone. It's, it's a range, right? So they have a certain amount of time to reach certain milestones, but going home always with that answer doesn't sit right. It doesn't sit right. So you do need to have someone who can really address the concern to the point where you know a proper workup was done and mm -hmm. then you can either feel at ease because you have a plan moving forward, right? Like, okay, if that's not it, then what are the other things I should be looking for? And how are we going to address that if that does come up, right? You should always have these sort of plans. This is important for, for people to understand. Like you are working with your doctor, right? You should have plans for certain things. You don't just leave it up to them and bye, see you in two or three months. Um, because two or three months can be a long time in brain development, right? So you don't, you don't want to lose out on that time. And in the first year and a half, if you can get to therapy by 18 months, if you can get to a doctor to listen to you before the 18 month mark, language development, it has been proven by the year and a half mark yeah. to help kind of rewire I know it sounds crazy the brain you can kind of train the brain right so like opposed to a child that's two and a half years old it's like anything else if you want to teach them another language young you want to do it when they're younger it gets harder as you age as you get accustomed to certain things and certain words and certain sounds that doesn't mean you go to therapy at a year and at a year and a half because you've been doing it before the year child's guaranteed to talk. I'm not saying that, so I don't want people to get that confused. But they're just going to be able to be better adaptive to whatever has been taught to them. So if they're not going to be verbal, they're still going to be able to communicate a lot better. Whether it's the PEC systems and pulling out pictures and pointing at things and telling you or signing. Whatever it is that they're doing to talk to you, to communicate, you have better chances of them being able to adhere to that communication style if you get to them early so that's why you want to push that's why you want to look for those signs don't go to that one year pediatrician appointment and just check off the list and like raise those concerns it's absolutely okay to raise those concerns because a lot of the times we don't want our child to be labeled they are those parents that are extremely anxious and 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 think everything is a concern and then there's those parents that are like oh no if I say that they might automatically think that my child is on the spectrum. I don't want that label. So I'm not even going to mention that at my doctor's appointment. So they avoid mentioning. And all you're doing is a disservice to yourself because the child suffers. Yes. But the parents are the ones that have to go through the motions afterwards and pick up the, the you know, the pieces when it's too late. So be very honest and transparent from the beginning. also had to deal um, with that piece, right? Where people are in denial or they're afraid to get a label. Um, and uh, you, you have to put that aside and just speak the truth for your child, right? You are their voice and you are their advocate and you have to, you know, be forthcoming with these things because we get our information from you. So don't be ashamed. Don't think that this means that you're a bad parent or that you did something wrong because I think a lot of times they 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 wonder that, right? Like, oh my goodness, what did I do? How come this is happening? And um, you know, it's it's our concern as a parent to always want to do the things that we have to do correctly for our kids. But, you know, it's no shame on you and there's no judgment on you. It's just about making sure that your child receives the services and support that they need early mm -hmm. on that's really the best predictor for how they do in their future because people always ask me like oh well what does this really mean well this means that we need to start you know having a plan in place getting all the services um started so that your child can thrive because there is a real possibility because just like you mentioned the brain is constantly like there's this neuroplasticity that, that's what it's called your brain can do so many changes in those early years. 
And if you want to give your child every chance to have a good future, um, then you need to start those services early on so that their brain does have that chance to really like have all those connections that are needed in order for them to gain language and understanding and understand even socially, you know, what, what they, they should be doing, how to pay attention to certain things, right. How to control their own behaviors. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a whole lot. It's a, it's a lot for them to take in. And when you have the proper support, you can see how much your child really has that, that chance to thrive because when they're younger, these changes happen really quickly within months, you can start like seeing a real change, especially when it comes to things like language. Um, so don't be worried about that because it really does get harder as they get older. You want to start off as soon as possible in order for your child to thrive. And, and in the, on top of that, you want to start off as soon as possible because people have the misconception that they get a diagnosis, they get the help. <laughs> no, <laughs> like I'm 10 years in and I'm still fighting for some services and some help. There's wait lists. Okay. And if those things weren't already challenging, COVID has made that even harder for people because we don't have enough therapists we don't have like if you're looking for a new career and this is your passion go into it like seriously because we don't you know um people are not coming into the homes like they used to come into homes before um there's wait lists on all kinds of services you know and finding the service that that meets your needs is different the service could be available to you but make sure it matches and meets your actual needs make sure that you are interviewing these therapists, this, these locations, um, checking their background, because, you know, you just don't want to put your child, you want him or her to get the best of the best. And you want to make sure it aligns with you, your work schedule, weekends, evenings, hours, morning, whatever it is that you need, that takes time. So you can get a diagnosis today and don't get into therapy for months on end. So take that into consideration too. Um, Nash, you know, um, it's really bad. Um, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about how this affected your family, because I think that's also like a huge, huge space that, um, I don't know if you're aware of like the studies, but studies show like it's like 80% of Latino families that actually end up in divorce when there is a diagnosis of like autism. And Absolutely. so- yeah, it, it has a lot to do with machismo. Um, and I know I've gone through it. You know, it's it's been such a journey and it still is. It's painful. It's really painful um, because you're dealing with a lot of changes, right? As through your motherhood journey and, and trying to um, advocate for your child and everything. And then at the same time, having to deal with maybe your family falling apart is is heartbreaking and it's it's very challenging for me it was extremely challenging i did fall into the 80 percent um i did my research early on when i felt that my marriage was kind of falling at the wayside and um you know you start to feel guilty for multiple things um because you say is it that I am neglecting the marriage and the spouse because I am so focused on the child. But in reality, I came back to the idea of I, my child did not ask to come into this world. We planned this pregnancy. We planned this child and he needs two parents to show up. And I found myself in a marriage where I was showing up by myself and not just physically at doctor's appointments, medical procedures, everything you could think of, but mentally, emotionally, like the only thing I can say that was consistently showing up on um, my child's father was financial. Financially was there, 1000%, but it takes more than that. And we were so disconnected. Um, and because of the machismo, because of the, my child doesn't have anything, you're just I mean, it was to a point where I was 
told that I had, um, maybe you can remember the, the medical condition where I'm just labeling my child sick. Oh, the Munchausen syndrome. Yeah. So I was, I, I have been told I have Munchausen's because, because my son has a rare genetic disease that's still to this day, 10 years and unknown, but he has all the markers in his DNA. I can't, I can't make up DNA. You know, I can't make up that my son is not meeting milestones. I couldn't make up those things, but, but the father was so in denial and um, being Latino puts even more pressure because it's kind of like a, we don't talk about it. We don't do that. Or no, you'll be the first in this family. Our family doesn't do that. You know what I mean? So then it was like, a, is it coming from your side of the family? Like, what are we talking about here? Like, unless that I know of, there's no marker that's telling me genetically whether it's on the Y chromosome or the X. So what are we discussing right now, right? So um, it was a lot of pointing the finger at each other. And we ended amicably, thank God, where we just realized this is not going to work. Um, the words that were used in court were not so amicable because it was, the judge came to the realization that I am the advocate and father is just like a leisure activity. Very um, lazy was the term that the judge used when it comes to standing up for my child, you know, um, and his medical conditions. I just, it didn't, it didn't hurt me in the sense that I can't believe my marriage failed. Because at, in the beginning, that's how you look at it, right? Like a failed marriage. But I don't I don't want a marriage that doesn't believe in my child or doesn't believe in getting my child and advocating. I can't imagine me being with someone right now that doesn't hold my hand while I'm advocating or that that if I'm not in the room can't advocate for my child. I am happily married now. OK, and my child has a stepfather who advocates just as strong as I do. So just to show, you know, there is like at the end of the tunnel for, for anyone else that is going through it and has been part of that 80%. But um, you realize that sometimes it's better to be alone and, and giving your all to your child than to be unhappy and still feel like you're alone, but yeah. just have the goal of having a partner. I didn't want that. Yeah, yeah. I hear you on that. I, I I felt like a single parent for so long. So I was like, what's the difference? <laughs> what is the difference? Plus, I don't have to deal with someone criticizing me in my space. That's supposed to be my peace, right? Um, And so, you know, I've been divorced now for like eight and a half years. And it's, it's, it's been rough. It's been really, really rough. I'm not going to lie about that you know, I wish that we ended things amicably, like, I really thought it could be that. Um, but because, because Aaron got diagnosed so much later, right, and it has a lot to do with this sort of thing of denial, right? It's like, I would say something and the other parent would not see it at all. In my house, this doesn't happen. You know, it was it was always that sort of thing. So going to doctor's visits was very, very conflicting for the, the practitioners that were seeing us, right? They saw two parents feuding all the time. And so that delayed the diagnosis for us because everything that I was seeing, his dad would not see. His, you know, it was like, two very, very, very different stories according to who you spoke to. And um, and also, I think that my son is very smart to the point where he can mask certain things. You know, masking is a real, real phenomena. And I know there are people that don't believe it, but my son is great at masking at school and he's great at masking at his dad's house. And then my home is the home where he can have the relief and be himself. And that's where the majority of the behaviors and stuff will come out, right? The repetitive movements, the, the emotional like breakdowns and stuff like that. The meltdowns really happen here. And, you know, then it was, I got accused of like, oh, that's because you just let him get away with this stuff. 
um, you know, it was it was a lot of that sort of thing. And, you know, again, that's part of the criticism that that you have to deal with sometimes when you're the mom who is advocating for your child because you also understand that they have to go through these challenges all day long, right? And I want him to know that here we accept you just exactly how you are. You don't have to be different. You don't have to pretend that you don't do those movements. You don't have well, to hide it. Give it to him at home. I mean, if you can't be safe at home, where can, where can you be safe at? Right, right. So, you know, going through through that and then having to be that strong also because you are doing it on your own um, and maybe still with somebody criticizing on top of that um, can, can come with its own, like that feels like a battle. It feels like a constant war sometimes for me personally, right? Like it really can feel like that. There are days where I'm like, oh my God you know, all I'm trying to do is make sure that our son is, is thriving. That's all I'm, I'm just trying to give him every opportunity, um, in order to make that happen. But one thing that I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned is that you are in a happy marriage that, you know, you, you were able to find a partner who is aligned with the work that you do with the way that you advocate and probably loves you so much because of, so what you do right it's it's not something that they use to um offend you or anything like that it's like wow you have all these beautiful qualities and they can see the beauty in it um versus it being looked at as you know a criticism um on your personality so I love that that you were that you didn't give up right no. That, that you didn't allow that experience to like hinder you from even looking for someone who could be um, your partner and your, you know, your soulmate and someone who gets you and understands you. Um, I'm happy that you kept looking and searching and that you found somebody and that you're in that sort of relationship right now, because Absolutely. I think for, for many of us, we're like, oh, forget it after that. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to deal with that. And it also goes for relationships in general. And it's not just a, a, a romantic relationships. This is family. This is friends. This is uh, acquaintances, lifetime friendships. Like if you have to part ways because they're not aligned with what you have going on or they're breathing in that negative energy into your life, you have enough on your plate that you're worrying about and figuring out day by day. And you don't need that. You need people that are going to bring in great energy that are going to be understanding that want to learn, you know, because they may not have a child. They may not even have to endure your child on a day-to-day -day basis, but they just want to learn because this is all around us. So those are the type of people you want around. And sometimes you have to separate yourself and it's hard, you know, because we do things out of comfort and out of habit. So to then restart and, you know, realign yourself with other people and other things, it's hard in the beginning, but it pays off in the end. This has given me a whole new meaning to life. And, you know, children naturally do that um, when you become a parent. But this is like, I have a whole new direction, a whole new path, a whole new, like, no matter how burnt out I may feel, this, I thrive in helping someone understand their family more. I thrive in... Um, connecting with people, um, letting people know that we are not, you're not alone in this situation, feeling um, like I can help one person is so satisfying for me. Um, getting to meet awesome, amazing people like you is like bonuses, you know, these are bonuses. Because at the same time, I'm doing all of this, but I am helping my son in the best way possible, you know? And I see it when he's in school. I see it when he's with a therapist. I see it when we're at the doctors, when they say, don't thank me, thank you. Because parents, we have the majority of the legwork to do. My therapists are seeing my son 30 minutes increments per week. 
that is great. I thank each and every one of them. I love what they do and they're very passionate about what they're doing. But at the end of the day, if I don't go home and take that 30 minute lesson, you know, I, you're not supposed to leave your child at therapy and walk away. <laughs> Some parents try to do that and go grab a coffee. I am very in tune and I need to know everything that's going on because how else am I going to implement that at home? So it, it has changed me. I've become such a different person over it. Um, I'm doing things I never thought I could do. I never in a million years thought I can become an author. I never in a million years thought that I'd be um, facilitating events. Um, I got a, a recently uh, an opportunity to speak at a huge university um, in part of advocating on a panel with all kinds of medical professionals. And this is why I tell people, you are the expert. You are the expert. You are the one that will speak for your child, verbal or not. You are the parent. You have to be able to communicate their needs, your needs, your wants, and, and, and question whatever it is that you may have questions about. And you bring, you manifest exactly what you want your child's future to be. You have control of that. Are you because we haven't really spoke about AJ, but um, because I really want to focus on you know on what your journey was like. But would you highlight for us because I love to talk about accomplishments? Um, you know, like what are some of his special talents? What are his special interests? Um, you know, just share that with us because I, I want parents to have hope for their children, especially if they're like brand new on this journey, right? Because I think sometimes everyone like freezes and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm afraid, right? And I, I just want to highlight how amazing each one of, of our children really are because they are so special. They really have these beautiful gifts. And I think it's important to talk about that because everybody talks about the behaviors or what it looks like or whatever, but like, let's highlight how wonderful they really are. My little AJ, I want people to understand that he didn't say any words until four years old mm -hmm. and he went from not speaking to reading stories articulating um he has um difficulty saying certain letters but for the most part he's able to express himself certain things in certain um settings classroom settings he is able to just do all the work academically he's really strong he is two to three grades ahead of time. Um, I keep, him. he's actually accomplished this year for the first time. He is in general education fully. Excellent. I saw that on TikTok. I am so happy for him. Yeah. Accomplishment that I push for, like I pushed so hard. Last year I was pushing for it. I got halfway there, but this year started fifth grade, fifth grade general education, fifth grade homework, because they weren't challenging him because of an yeah. IEP, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So those things are huge. I want to take away that affection and con eye contact is not always a sign of autism. My son makes eye contact. Mm -hmm. My son is the most affectionate and loving child. Yeah. He says good morning, good night. He needs to hug everyone when he first meets them. It's kind of scary because, you know, I have to teach him not to hug everybody. But um, I don't want to take that lovingness away from him. It's so pure. Yeah. Um, hyper focuses movies. He loves movies. He loves facts about movies, like mm -hmm. these studios that were producing the direct directors. His goal is to be a director one day. Um, he can talk about the minutes. He memorizes um, any movie, even if it's an adult movie. He can tell you what year it came out, how many minutes is the movie, um, and the calendar. My son has memorized the calendar. 2022, 2023, 2024. You tell him any day of the year, any day of the week, you say October 1st, and he'll tell you, oh, that lands on a Wednesday. Oh, and you tell him the year, and he'll know exactly what is what. Um, that fascinates me. He plays yeah. sport, he plays Special Olympics baseball. Um, don't limit your child. Um, if I can give you one consejito, little advice is um, make your child do to the best of their ability, not your definition, what you would make your typical child do. My child has to make a bed. My child has to clean. My child has to bathe himself. My child has to 
Not saying that every child is going to do it, but if you just continue the routine of teaching them how to do it, just like you teach a one, two-year-old, three-year-old, I don't care if he's 10. My son is just now still in diapers, 10 years old. It's been like three weeks without a diaper, but I don't know what's that going to do because we've regressed before. I just take it day at a time and I teach him every single day, every single day. He doesn't know how to tie a shoe. We work on it every single day. Just keep doing that because you give him the expectation of being independent one day. You don't know if he'll fully be independent or she'll be independent, but the hope says they pick up as much as they can from you. Like you have to constantly be their cheerleaders and you have to push them a little bit, you know, because sometimes they also get like, oh, you know, they, they know they could get away with certain things, but you know, like any kid, right? Any kid will be like, oh yeah, if I don't have to do that, I'm not going to do it. Um, but yes, absolutely. Push them a little bit, be their cheerleader, show them how proud you are and allow them to be proud of themselves when they hit those milestones. And it's, you know, it, it's work every single day. It's, you know, we are all works in progress. Like that's fine. Right. Um, there's a learning curve for everything. There's going to be frustrations. There's going to be regressions. Um, and then, you know, you give it a break and you, you try again, you know, you know, give them, give them that little bit of time to process it. And then here we go again. You know, this is just normal life. This is how we reach our goals in life. Right. Um, so those are really important pieces of, of advice, you know, that you shared with everybody, because I think that sometimes we do get a little comfortable with, you know, with certain things. And it's like, no, nope, we got to keep doing the work. You, you never give up on the work. Um, and, and expose them to everything because you don't know sometimes what they are capable of, you know, like I had no idea my son has fine motor issues and he could play the drums. Like, you know, it, it's wonderful. Amazing. Um, it is, it's really amazing. And they, there is just so much growth in them. Right. So whatever you may see initially, don't think you're stuck there, exactly. you know? It's just Our children become adults and, and we forget that, right? Because we 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 handicap them ourselves. You know, yeah. I'm gonna live it. You can say whatever you want. It's it's a natural thing. Like you yeah. just limit them. But at the end of the day, it, your your children are gonna grow up. So you want them to be the best of, of the best at their age and what they can handle, you know? Yeah. What you and it and it's work now for you, but it'll alleviate a lot of stress for you later, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And they love to be independent. They, they love when they could like, oh man, I, I really could do this. And they didn't even know that they could do that. Right. Um, so it, it is extra work for us. Um, but as a parent, it's just, it's part, it's part of parenting. It's just part of parenting period. Right. Um, but thank you so much, Marlene. I feel like I could always do a million episodes with you because you have a lot to say. <laughs> And I want people to know about your workshops and the work that you're doing and where to find you. So please share that. Yeah, so I'm all over from my website, helpingswans.com, to um, which is a nonprofit organization, which I host three different types of workshops. And you can find me on um, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram under Helping Swans. Um, link tree where you can just look up helping swans and right there you'll be able to pull up all my information from where to buy my books they're all over amazon barnes and nobles target walmart um i have a superstar heroes theme book um and i talk about disability inclusion so I have three workshops that we focus on with my nonprofit organization, and one is called Abilities in Action, and that is where we discuss disability inclusion and the gift of giving, and that is an all-age group from children to adults. Then I have Capabilities Campaign, where I discuss with children uh, visible and invisible disabilities along with anti-bullying for children um, that are disabled. And then I have- You need to be at every school doing that. Yeah, I'm trying, girl, help me get out there. I'll come to New Jersey and do it. I have literally <laughs> done it here and I'm willing to fly. Um, people have that misconception. I have gone out of state. I actually have an event now in uh, Miami next month. Um, but my last one is Family for Life. It's based off of a book that I wrote, which was like a little short story of caregiving, like 
the, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, and what it is, is a caregiving workshop teaching um, how to advocate, supplying resources, and just being a support system and kind of like a little gathering where you get together with other people and just talk and network and exchange information with one another. So I kind of targeted three different areas where no matter what your situation is, you can kind of take something away from each one of my workshops. Uh, I love that. Keep doing all the good work that you're doing. I love it so much. And it's so Thank important. You. And, you know, you're, like I said, you're just very honest about it. And, um, and I just love to see AJ and all his accomplishments and seeing how amazing he's doing. So uh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for giving me some of your time. I know you're super busy. Um, You have a lot of things going on. I think from the, from when I first found you on social media to now there's been a lot of growth marty you you should be really proud of yourself i'm like super yeah. proud of you i'm super proud of you keep going palante girl because you got this you know you're doing good work yeah. and i just love the way you do it i love the way you do it so do your thing do your thing um but you know, you're always welcome to come back on the podcast because you always have a lot to share. And I think, you know, people really relate to you and and your story. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe because I'm going to start doing things for single moms too soon. You know, maybe you could come on for that one too. Give everybody some hope. I will always have time for you, okay? If there's one thing that I guarantee you, I'm always going to have time for you. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you so much. Um, give AJ a hug for me since he loves to give hugs. I love hugs too. Those are like the, the most special gifts for me that, you know, that I could receive from kids um, because they do it with so much cariño, so much love and it's real. Anyway, right? it's real. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I know, I know you're a little scared when he goes out there hugging everybody, but he's just spreading so much love and joy. Like you can't even, you know, I'll give you you, right? like, yeah, exactly yeah oh. all right well thank you so so much I really love you a lot I'm always like you know just as much as I can I'm always telling everybody about you and your work because I know how important it is I really believe in you I want you to know that you have a friend in me um you know if you ever whatever we will be collaborating all the time we <laughs> are thank you I appreciate you so much more than you know Hugs and kisses, Thank okay? To you and all. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with your family and friends. Also, join me for my group parenting sessions. I want you to be the first to know, so go directly to my website at www.drdivinalopez.com and share your email with me. That way you'll be the first to know when sessions start. Also, you can find me on Instagram at Dancing Into Parenthood and on TikTok at Dr. Divina Lopez. Also, if you like this podcast, please subscribe. That way you always know when a new episode drops. I love you. Bye. Please keep in mind that all advice given in this podcast is general information. To understand your specific situation, you must consult with your pediatrician.